to our 2014 Rewired Showcase. I'm Michael Senemal. I'm an educational technologist here at the Center for New Media. This is my colleague and partner, Adrian Garber, and we welcome you all today. Thank you. Um, if I may, let me just give you a little sense of the spirit of Rewired. Uh, we've had eight talks this semester, and we really wanted to get faculty together in a room and talk and exchange ideas and perhaps the challenges that they've had with their, uh, using technology in their classroom. We hope that we as ETs and other ET colleagues of mine could exchange our experiences with faculty and come up with sort of an idea, a unique implementation for them. And we hope that faculty would come back sort of with a, with a rough outline of what they wanted to do and we could help them achieve that. And then we always hope that they propagate out and tell other people about our, our talks, which I, I see from the room that that's happening. Hello everybody, thanks for being here. My name is Reyes uh, Yofi Gracia and I am the uh, co-director of the Spanish language program at the Department of Latin American and Iberian Cultures. And uh, I'm here today because I have three issues that I would like to um, discuss with you and to, um, and to talk to you about because the rewired sessions have uh, really made a difference and made a huge impact in the way I teach or that I've been teaching this semester. So. Those are my two courses. I teach Intermediate 1 and Advanced Language through Content, and I have uh, 15, 12 students, no teaching assistant, of course, and <laughs> <laughs> all me. Um, so uh, there were three things that uh, I had um, in mind. So the first issue was with me in my Intermediate 1 course, and some of you who attend the Rewired sessions uh, know about this already because I presented um, about the Twitter project um, three weeks ago or two weeks ago. So, um, at Columbia, with the language requirement that we have, we need to comply with um, a set of final projects, both at Columbia and Barnard. So, these final projects um, require that students interact with the target language um, beyond the campus and beyond the classroom. So, they, this is a city that has Spanish everywhere, so students go out and, and do something with the language. So, I wanted the students to do this, and I created the concept NYC. So NYC with Spanish. Um, so I wanted them to go out and explore and discover the city, but I really wanted them to do that while bonding and, and working collaboratively with each other. So not to be uh, doing um, an individual final project that doesn't that only I will get to read or only I will get to know about. So I wanted them to get to know each other better and to bring those interactions that they would have outside of the classroom to the classroom. So if they bring it back, my idea was that if there's a better relationship among the students, there will be a better learning environment. So the tool that helped me uh, work with this was social media um, equals social classroom is Twitter. So I'm just going to browse through some of the examples. This project is ongoing right now. Um, so students um, go out there and have some visual input. And in this case, uh, they, they're tweeting um, this sign that has English and Spanish. and a linguistic analysis of the translation um, happens. Or um, of my 15 intermediate one students, nine are athletes at <laughs> Columbia. Um, so they're very interested. Yes, it's almost all men, which is uh, remarkable for a language class. And um, they are very interested in <laughs> And uh, they, um, well, they've gone to the Yankee Stadium and they see something in Spanish, so they snap a photo of it, and then a discussion uh, about who's better, the Red Sox or the Yankees. <laughs> um, there is also a lot of art in, Spanish, in the Spanish-speaking world in New York City, so students go to the Met or students go to the MoMA and see a Picasso, so they snap a picture of it, and there's always an interaction. One student always, or two students always reply to that, so they get to converse outside of the classroom, and in this case, at the MoMA, um, commands and subjunctives were to be seen at the museum, so there is an interaction of the language that we see in class out kid there in the real world. Um, these are my Columbia athletes, they speak Spanish and they um, support each other, so they go to see each other's games and they go to cheer for each other, so they report on that and they uh, talk about it and even talk about Instagramming. So this is the Twitter project, in intermediate one. If you want to follow us, this is our hashtag, Columbia Barna 1201. Um, and the project is still ongoing until next week. And, uh, 
they're presenting this Tuesday. So that was my first issue, and I think it's working out well. Um, second issue has to do with time management. Um, and, it, and we move around to my uh, advanced language through content course, and this is where Rewired comes to the rescue um, with the issues that I was having, because the advanced language through content class is a class that has a backbone of culture and cultural topics, but also big attention to the language. And combining the two of them is hard when the course only meets twice a week. So I wanted the students to have more practice, more discussion, and more interaction in class, in the classroom, and to spend less time giving explanations, instructions, and directions. We all teach and we all know that that takes up a big chunk of our time in class. So I wanted to give, with the language, with the foreign language after all, it's advanced, but it's a foreign language. So I wanted to give the control back to the students. And um, when I give the instructions and the, intera and, the, and the directions and the explanations, I wanted them to be able to um, control that interaction with me and with a foreign language and pause, replay, fast forward, rewind, just repeat whatever I was telling them to do in their own time and at their own pace. Um, so that was issue number two, and issue number three within issue number two is uh, that I wanted them to work more on their pronunciation and intonation when they speak Spanish, so to give them more of an oral confidence when they uh, use the language. So what was the tool? VoiceThread. And the idea behind it was work at your own pace with uh, what we have to do in class. So two things that we've been working on, um, second language processing and understanding. They work with essays and they uh, and I collect those essays and correct them. So I assemble and collect uh, um, the errors that are um, common to all of them. So this is a PowerPoint that I would have used in class at any other time and I actually did at the beginning of the semester when I still didn't know that I could do this. And that's me and that's me talking. So um, I am able to explain all the errors that uh, happen in their compositions and they can um, just listen to it and pause it and replay it and rewind it and actually interact with the Spanish and the focus on the form and the focus on the language however they want. And I'm also doodling here, so I'm directing their attention to the different parts of the slide. So that is, has been working out really great and the students have appreciated that uh, and, and the service that I've been giving them. And uh, the other use of VoiceThread that I've done is uh, we worked with external media for a class assignment where there was a documentary online that could not be embedded on CourseWorks or anywhere, could not be taken out of the original website where it was. And it was a documentary on history, very, very big, and I really wanted my students to work with that. So what I did was to take, sna well, to take snapshots there of um, the documentary everywhere, and I was doodling around to tell them what to see, what to go, where, they, where to click. And I gave them um, written instructions and also oral instructions on how to navigate that documentary. So they were also, they said it was a good thing to be able to come back to the instructions and be able to listen to them again and then go to the, uh, go and manage the documentary. So that was a very successful task as well. And the very fun part of this is the, this work on pronunciation to give them oral confidence in their explanations. And this is happening right now, this week. Um, and they're still working on it. So I gave them, they read the stuff and I gave them uh, different comprehension questions and they chose whichever questions they wanted to answer. They w wrote a script and they worked on it. And these are all of them speaking. That's Nicole right there. And she's talking right now in my screenshot. And the, all the slots that you see down there are student <coughs> questions. So they are Re uh, they are replying to my questions, they are replying to each other, so they're listening to each other, and they're not only listening to me as a native speaker, they're listening to each other um, also. And um, that, has been, that has been working out really well, and the students loved it, and we just did it in class uh, on Thursday. And uh, that, what it does, it brings, it continues the work in class outside of the classroom. And then my issue three has to do again with collaboration beyond the class and Rewire came again to my rescue. And uh, I wanted students to collaborate and continue the in-class work at home. So integrate the readings, the class discussion, the individual research, and to get them peer feedback. And also, uh, since architecture is one of our topics, I wanted them to do visual and written work on it. So media thread uh, with the idea that it's better when we work together was the tool. And um, Adrian and Sarah, can you really help here? 
And just to show you, a student discussion continuation of in-class work. Um, this is a monument we've been working on. Every student chose a part of the monument they were interested in. And um, did some research on it, did some, uh, like, uh, an intro on it. And uh, there's um, students giving them feedback on it. It's, it's a longer discussion. I just put one example there. That's another. Uh, oh, no. And the student actually selected here where her monument part was. And here's another one, chose to work on this watchtower, so he selected that and put several photos of the watchtower for everybody to see and explain, and that was part of the discussion. And this is our collection on architecture. Only two of those images I've imported myself. The rest of them came from the students. They went to the collections, different collections, and looked for them and imported them there and showed them to their classmates as we were discussing the different topics on architecture. And this is our collaborative annotated analysis of this particular work where everybody selected one different part, um, gave notes and tags to identify what it was, and here you can actually, just, if you clicked on that, you would display it, and it would just show you um, what they wrote about it. So in the conclusions, thank you to Sarah Gidi, Michael, and Adrian, because the rewired sessions have been the highlight of my semester. They were absolutely inspiring. And the story continues because this has inspired me so much that I um, applied for a grant for a course relief for the fall of 2014 so that I can make a fully rewired Spanish 3300 for next semester. So if you have any questions or comments afterwards, just come talk to me or tweet at me. Thank you. about many issues I have, but I'll focus on two and make it two stories. So um, with the help of Michael and Adrian, thank you so much, I've implemented two media, which I'll talk to you about. The first is VoiceThread and the second is MediaThread. Um, and they were used for very different purposes because I have very different needs and issues. So the first is VoiceThread. And um, for me, because it's a media course and what people are learning from media and how media impacts, it was very important for me to try to bridge the content with um, relevance outside of that academic world. What does it mean to be a consumer of media? Um, what is it like to work with media as future teachers or people who will be working in companies? There are some students in the class who are in the HR department, and so it was important for me to try to bridge that. And so I thought having some guest speakers who work, create media, and are in that world might be a way to connect them. And so then the need and issue became very practical. How do I bring them together on an online course? So um, the first talk um, I'm going to show you is with Pete Austin. He's the senior producer at Nightline. And given his schedule and time constraints, he had asked to have students ask him questions. And his talk would really focus on answering every single one of their questions. So let me play for you. So the question is in the text. Social media, um, you all have a lot of questions about that, and, and I think rightfully so. Um, and I would say that social media and Twitter, Facebook, any kind of uh, sharing that happens instantaneously around the world uh, is incredibly exciting, can be incredibly useful, uh, useful uh, and informative, um, and also terrifies me. Um, terrifies me as a uh, as a both a producer uh, and as a consumer. Um, you know, Twitter often gives us the first indications uh, of the scope of a uh, breaking news story. Uh, this was true uh, in the uh, the terror assaults uh, in Mumbai. Um, at the uh, at the, uh, sh the the shooting at the hotel there um, some years back um, in uh, situations uh, like the Haiti uh, earthquake um, and even uh, just yesterday um, at Fort Hood uh, when there was very little information coming out um, there were tweets about it being a shooter an active shooter situation um, and that there had been injuries y useful yes um, um. 
that really afforded that sort of connection, but also reflection, I think, that could not have happened um, without VoiceThread and Michael and Adrian. So this next guest speaker I had is Carrie Matlows. She was actually a former student of mine and at TC, and she is, um, what's her title? She's like a fancy senior director of research at Time Warner, so that's the magazine arm. And from talking to her, she wanted to present this study that they recently conducted using eye tracking tool. And so um, what it is is specifically for this study where the difference is, does the, do you see the little hand there? Yes. Yeah, okay, so both covers are exactly the same. The only difference is in that circle. The one on the left talks about great outfits. The one on the right has the name of that actress, uh, Hayden Panettiere. And then the page number to the story in that magazine. And so. Here, as she's going through, things, um, just I'm to just going to show gonna... you this research. And basically, what I'm going to show you is a comment. So I'm going to talk over her a little bit because it's, it's a long um, segment there. But what, what she found, and as she'll play for you, the heat map is where the eyes were directed when each participant um, looked at each cover. And you'll see um, on the left where it's red is where most of the eyes went. Um, so you'll see that on the left, it was more at um, Hayden Panettiere's chin or sort of face. And the cover on the right, you could see that the heat map, it was stronger in that area where there was a circle where her name was right next to her face. And you'll hear um, her talk about, at the end, the hypothesis that they had. Hayden Panettiere's name and the button. And also, I should mention, it also had the page number that the article was in, which we Which ended up being the case, that having that name next to her face increased sales. So. You have students listen to this, and then they're like thinking, gosh, you know, okay, that's interesting. So what I thought was super cool, which just happened recently, was that you have the student here talking about. Hi, um, thank you so much for sharing, first of all. I found all of this very interesting, and so I wanted to take a look at all of my magazines and see um, about the name bubble. I found that very interesting that the name bubble next to the face, or having the name near the face, um, played a role. And so I wanted to see, do like a small random sample um, of which magazines I had that did that. Um, and in doing so, I actually flipped through a bit to see which articles I had read and why, and I found something even more fascinating. Um, so I want to share a bit. So they have a back and forth, and um, Carrie uh, gave her a free subscription to People Style. So that's, that's another bonus, right? It's like very cool. That would not have happened, I think. Um, so then the next thing that I want to talk about briefly is Media Thread, and the need issue here very simple: Are the students reading, and specifically in this case, viewing the assigned material? So. I assign um, students very um, different essays, but oftentimes the whole goal is read the readings, analyze it, but incorporate the media that I've added to this session. So it becomes sort of this illustration of what the concepts are. And so early on in the semester, we cover the various theories of media psychology. One of them is um, social cognitive theory, basically saying that whatever you view, you oftentimes model the actions. And so Albert Bandura's classic Bobo doll study, and I'll show you little clips because I have, I think, one minute left. Uh, an adult the, uh, uh, model, hits the doll. With the, the doll. And then the child models it, and then later on the child picks up new aggressive behavior and has a gun and, you know, points it to the Bobo doll. What happened in the past was prior to using MediaThread, I would put this assignment up in the class wiki. And as you can see, there's the text. You can tell, yes, 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 you read. But then there you go. Dump that whole YouTube video clip. I have no idea from that how much of the student watched, what parts grabbed him or her. But in MediaThread, you can embed it and sort of play back and forth. Um, and I just want to end with showing you, I just took snapshots. You can see that in this student, she did the adult by the title of the uh, club, the child modeling. That's fine, but probably A minus because we didn't get the gun there. Again, <laughs> I'd say A minus, right? You, but you get, and so after a while, you see this section, and in a way, A, because she got the trigger behavior with a gun, A, A, um, is that that was sort of a visual heat map for me to see what students would find and where I would see three clips instead of two. So that was an unexpected surprise. Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Tamara Moss Knight with the School of Social Work. We're really excited to be here. I am an adjunct assistant professor, and this semester I taught two courses, the human behavior in the social environment and direct practice with individuals, families, and groups. And those are going to be the classes where I was able to enhance learning and also integrate technology. So I'd like to start before I get into my lessons plans, kind of framing where the need and ideas and planning um, for this process came from. And I'm going to use actually Michael's framework of need, ideas, technology to guide me because I am a talker. <laughs> so <laughs> the need, it was I think in part twofold. Um, one was from the student perspective and enhancing their learning through integrating meaningful technology in the classroom. And for me as a faculty member, there were several things. Um, it was an opportunity to integrate technology to enhance my teaching, I thought. Um, it would allow for meaningful activity for the lecture, that it wasn't just busy work that I was going to be giving students. An opportunity to enhance what I learned through Rewired that's called the Community of Inquiry. So my social teaching and cognitive presence, enhancing those and applying the learning from the Rewired series in the same semester that I was actually going through the learning. And so that whole expression of if you don't use it, you'll lose it, well, I wanted to use it because I did not want to lose it. And what happened um, serendip serendipitous, I think, for me, I had a planned absence um, this semester because I was a conference director at an international conference. And I thought, what would I do if I had more time in the classroom? even though I wouldn't be there physically. Just to give you a little bit of uh, background about the two classes, um, both classes are connected on how does the environment affect behavior and vice versa, and then how should we as social workers fit into this dynamic? What is our role? So like a good student of Rewired, I used the goal and objective flowchart for class planning <laughs> and thought, what would I do if I had more time? What would my topics be? And for me, I wanted my direct practice class to focus on parent and child relationships. And for my human behavior and social environment, I wanted us to focus on gender-based violence. So the pedagogy that I chose was the flipped classroom. And for those who are not familiar, that's when you have the opportunity to have um, what some may consider homework outside of the classroom setting. But then you're using that class time to have more in-depth discussions around certain topics, concepts, experiences, um, and opportunities. The technology that I integrated was the TED Talk. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with the TED Talk lectures. And then um, developed through the TED Ed a lesson plan. I think this is the direct practice class where I focused on parent um, child relationships. So for implementation, I was not going to be there for the formal class. So in my absence, I used these TED Ed lesson plans to hold what I would call a lecture. And they were to view these videos um, that ranged between nine minutes and about 19 minutes um, for each class respectively. And this video with Angela Patton lasted about nine minutes and focused on parent-child relationships. The students were to register for TED-Ed, so it got them, um, I think, invested in the technology as users and subscribers. Watch the video as a lecture, and I'm a little scared right now, but my, my ETs are here. <laughs> okay, let's begin. So I say to students, in an effort for continued learning, the lesson plan has been set up as a flipped class for our, our course. Um, please complete the required readings for the sessions that they were giving in the syllabus. But what I did was beyond the video, if they wanted to dig deeper, there was an additional resource to explore, um, some evidence-based practice related to that topic. And then along with that, and finally, they were going to come prepared to class to discuss um, in small groups the lecture and their feedback. Um, they were also going to primarily focus on issues related to the implications to social work practice, policy, and research. 
very, very um, time-consuming, deep discussions could occur with that. Um, so what I did, um, as they watched the videos, did I get out of it? The same was done for the human behavior and the social environment class that focused on gender-based violence. And what I did, um, based on the feedback, because along with the videos that they viewed, the required reading, the optional reading, they were going to email me directly while I was away a paragraph in response to the lecture, to the content. And that was an opportunity for me to frame their areas um, or comments around gender, role, culture, families, parent-child relationships. I use their feedback to frame the discussion of our class, which for human behavior in the social environment was two hours of in-depth discussion, and for direct practice was three hours of small group work, in-depth discussion, reflection, um, addressing issues of self-awareness, et cetera. The outcome, the technology I integrated was SurveyMonkey, which is free, I believe, up to 10 questions. And I thought, well, I'm not going to go beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was free access to the students. Um, they were then sent a link uh, once we had, so how it worked was I was away. They had the flipped lecture, where it was an online lecture. Once I came back the following week, we had those hours of in-depth discussion framed around the issues that they raised and additional ones that I brought. And then um, right after class, they had the opportunity to provide feedback, not just on the content, but also on the technology this time. What I'm going to focus on here um, is the technique and content pieces that the students said was really helpful to them, and some not so helpful. So for some, it was better for introverted students. It increased processing time in the classroom. Um, and one student mentioned that they had not taken into account that they could learn from their fellow students. <laughs> this is a graduate master's um, program in social work. I found that very interesting. And so this was an opportunity to expand their notion of learning. Um, helpful to see social work values implemented. The information was able to sink in. I think like some of um, my colleagues have mentioned before, students were able to go back and revisit um, the content at their own pace and respond, of course, within a certain time to the paragraph response. And a great format outside of reading their required articles and such. So I welcome any questions that you have. I felt that um, through the Rewired series and the help of Adrian and Michael, I was able to enhance my students' learning, enhance my teaching that fell in line with the social work's mission to promote human rights and social justice through graduate social work education. Uh, this is my class. Um, I teach a seminar uh, for environmental leadership, ethics, and action. Uh, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about it, uh, but that's my first slide just to orient you in the context of my classroom. Uh, uh, my name is Diane uh, Kendra Dietrich, uh, and I teach in the Department of Environmental Science at Barnard College, uh, and I've been teaching there for um, 20 years, um, so I have quite a, quite a history there. Uh, I want to acknowledge Michael Tanamo and, and Adrian uh, Barber for having invited me to this particular session. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I, I, I keep on saying to encourage myself to get over the nervousness uh, that you, you have been invited, you, uh, you were selected to be here. <laughs> and I hear what you have to say, so why should I be worried? <laughs> Forget it already. Um, uh, the name of my course is Environmental Leadership Ethics in Action. It started out uh, being called Environmental Literature Ethics in Action, and I developed the course in 2006 based on the fact that, uh, first of all, I wanted to develop a course of my very own, and uh, I was in the department for a while already, and I said, you know, I want to do something of my very own. So I said, I was interested in the environment, that sounds good. I like to read, that's good. I'm interested in ethical and moral issues, that's good. So let me kind of put it all together and like, you know, kind of stir the pot and, and see what I could produce. It wasn't long, it became environmental leadership ethic in action. It kind of morphed into that almost instantaneously, but it took a whole year of doing before it changed. The, um, 
I feel that we, um, in, as it relates to technology, I feel there's one kind of a minor award, but I think it's kind of a major award as it relates to technology. Uh, that course had the first blog at Barnard. It was the first student blog that I know of. Um, it was the first public student blog. It was the first blog in the class of students. I mean, among the class, they were the first to have ever done that. And it was the first for me. So in 2006, you know, I was kind of a, a, mini, a very mini pioneer in it all. Um, and I'm still working on making that possible. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself now. Okay, I am passionate and curious about just about everything. And the world around me is sort of an endless um, place for me to wander <coughs> and find things that are of interest to me uh, in all different kinds of ways. And another thing that I wanted to let you know about me, I'm actually uh, kind of uh, in hiding. Um, uh, I'm, I kind of am a wannabe, an ET wannabe, okay? Uh, although I, I kind of feel like I don't totally measure up to it in some way or other, but in my heart of hearts, that's where it goes, and that's really the truth. I have a long way to go, but I'm still trying to make it happen in the best way that I could do it. And um, I know I have a long way to go, but my passion and my curiosity about the world around me and those things that excite me it becomes my driving force for it all. So I feel that at some point in time, I will arrive, I think I know when I will, uh, because right now it doesn't feel that way, but I'm still working on it. Now, uh, we're here to talk about, um, I guess this slide got pushed up. We're here to talk about um, Basically, why I came um, to Columbia Center of Meeting and Teaching and Learning with this idea, uh, what, what was the reason for my doing it, what was the reason as it relates to the course that I, I do, um, and um, you know, was I satisfied with the whole process. Given the fact it's in a, a leadership course, what I wanted to do in the context of this course was to develop, being interested in technology, I wanted to develop a toolkit for leaders in the context of the course itself. I felt that technology is so pervasive, you can't avoid it anymore, even if you're trying to do so. So I felt that it would be handy for me and for them to incorporate it in some way. So, um, so um, there's part of the story that, you, um, that I also will let you know. Um, I have a little secret. The history of all of this is Michael Chinamo, when I started Environmental Literature Ethics in Action in 2006, was the first person that I know who was patient enough to take me through some of the technologies that I never knew about. So it was the, the so he, I have to say, mesmerized me with the magic of technology. I'm not kidding. Uh, and he was extremely patient when I, I went to him to have him uh, help me put my course up on CourseWorks. And uh, I think probably the thing that amazed me uh, most was when he uploaded a video to my CourseWorks page. And I had them there, you know, with a press of a button to show my class when the time came. Uh, so that's really where the beginning uh, started as it relates to my being educated in, uh, in technology. Um, I want to add that Michael is tremendously gifted uh, in his ET technology, um, and he is an, an incredibly patient teacher. So much of the uh, magic is still a mystery to me, uh, but, I, but I am still excited about it all. Now, what's the ELA mission, Environmental Leadership Action Mission? I can get to my, my mind map. Uh, Michael also told me about mind maps, although this is not a digital mind map, but I wanted to do a mind map of my course so I can understand what I did finally after having started this in 2006, it's evolved to this. You may not be able to read it all up there, nor am I going to take you through it all, but I'm just going to give you like highlights uh, of it in general. And so you get the idea, but I certainly would love to speak with you afterward if you have any questions about the, the, the uh, structure of the class. The mission is an undergraduate, <coughs> upper level, student-centered, um, uh, what is it? <laughs> student-centered uh, teaching and learning experience that features uh, uh, real, independent, real-time, real-life learning in the class. 
complicated uh, concept, but actually all that I want to bring to the class is to kind of energize the main focus of the class, and that is lead leadership through many different uh, ways of, of doing it. Now, the structure of the course is um, uh, it's multidisciplinary, it's complex, it's dynamic, and it's integrated. It's kind of like a Lego set. As you can see, there are many different parts, and each of them is very, um, I don't know uh, how to impress you uh, on this, but each little piece is a very integral part to the entire structure of the class, and everything is related to the other piece. So it's very carefully considered, um, and um, it, it takes a lot to kind of make it happen and, and bring everything around. The main um, pillars of the course are lead, uh, uh, personal growth and uh, leadership development, capacity building, skill building, expertise building, and action awareness. And it's all built into the model. And I, I call it uh, also the, the skills are, I want to say reading, writing, and arithmetic, but it's basically reading, writing, and critical thinking. So it's all part of that package while they're developing of their capacity in environmental, uh, uh, in environmental issues. Now, as it relates to the technology project, what I asked Michael and Nathan to do was to work out a technology toolkit that I could use as one of the Lego pieces in there as part of the skill set that the students will use in order to facilitate their work in the class. Uh, after this was um, discussed in a brainstorming session with Michael and Adrian, we both outlined our work. We came together in a few sessions. Before you knew it, we had it worked out. It, I mean, it sounds like we didn't spend much time, but it was deeply engaging at, at every level. Uh, the, the final product was is uh, Michael and Adrian came to the classroom for a workshop of two hours with our students to teach them the tools and the students would go away, go away and incorporate what they learned in the work that they would be doing. Uh, so not only did we work on the development of the technology, but they also came to the classroom in order to conduct the seminar or workshop to have that happen. Um, since I got my one minute sign, I know that I have just less than that to go. Um, and I just want to say uh, as my closing remark, as I said in the beginning, there's magic in technology. So let's take, remove the mystery and bring it into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And we all need to work together on that. So I want to thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So my name is Hia Salma, and I'm from the English department, and I teach in, in the core, Columbia core. Michael had asked me a while ago about incorporating technology into my classroom, and I always said that there's no real need for this because the focus um, of my class is on discussing texts. So uh, the course that I teach is called Liter Literature Humanities, Masterpieces of Western uh, Literature and Philosophy, and we go from, from um, Homer to Virginia Woolf. And I didn't want to use technology just to use technology, yeah? Uh, so to use it, I had to feel like it's meaningful, not only for me, but also for the students. But however, this semester, after I saw that my students were more connected to their iPhones during breaks <laughs> than to one another, I realized that maybe I do need to find a way in which students can meet and connect to one another in an online learning space. So after talking to one of my students and Michael, I decided to propose to the class the idea of writing a collaborative project in which they could engage with and reflect on the course materials in a different creative way. And I chose the form of the epic because, and I can tell you later as to why, why the epic, uh, because believe it or not, it's actually manageable. Um, but mostly uh, the first reason was that we had read a few epics in the course, and those, so the students were somewhat familiar with the style and tone of it. And after talking to Michael, we decided that the best platform for this project would be uh, Wiki Scholars. So let me just show you this. So you can, you can see, I'll, I'll show some, some links here too, in just a little bit. 
So the overview of the project. The project had two rounds. In the first round, we divided the students into five groups of four. And Michael and I created project pages, which I won't show, you, but, but they're here. And in these project pages, each group could do their drafting and communicating to one another. And each group had a week to complete their entries. The instructions that I gave for the groups were purposefully very, very basic. So I said, um, read what your colleagues, colleagues have written before, and each student writes 10 lines, just 10 lines, and maintain the line length to give unity to the work and carry the story forward, mm -hmm. and build intertextuality, by which I mean refer back to the texts um, that we discussed throughout the course and use the same, some of the same, same themes. So from the very beginning, this, this was an experiment. Um, I actually even didn't have it on the, on the syllabus, and I can tell you later how I dealt with this, because you don't want to, in the middle of the semester, mm -hmm. to create more work for the students. So I actually released them from something. Uh, I can tell you later. So it works. And there was no grade, and so, mm. OK. Yes, OK. And then for each group, I also gave more specific guidelines. Each of the, or each of the um, how many groups? I did uh, five groups. But those more specific guidelines were never about the content. They were more, I saw myself as a, as a, um, as a conductor or the person who has like a bigger view of the project. So the guidelines that I gave for the, for the smaller groups were more, um, served the purpose of orienting the students within the work. So for example, for the group that went as the fourth group, I said, you know, you're, by the end of your entry, you want the protagonist to be ready to come back home from the journeys because there's only one group left after your, uh, after your epic entry, so, and their job is going to be to wrap things up. So once the writing was done, we started the second round of work, which was to annotate and add multimedia. So Michael visited our class and showed us how to add links and comments. And we actually also took some time in class, like 30 minutes or so, to work together as a group on this. And I asked each student to do two things. To find, first thing, to find one word or phrase or image from their own entry, their own 10 lines, and write a little self-reflexive commentary as to why they used that theme, that image, or that phrase, what inspired them. Um, so it was like a, like a mini artist statement, and an opportunity for the student to, to write in the epic in a different kind of voice. And then the second thing that I asked them to do was to find to find something in um, another person's stanza and create, find, um, find an image or a sound clip to, to go with it, so to add, to add more layers and to make the work multimedia work. And I said that this, this image that you find or the sound clip that you find, you can be serious there or funny and you can trick the reader or you can be serious and traditional. So they had a lot of um, freedom when it comes to this. And then we also had two, I should mention this, this is important, that we also had two student editors. Um, we had an arts, arts editor, illustrator, who, uh, who did the, the drawings, which I also, by the way, love so much, because I wanted students to have an opportunity to mm -hmm. like, create something with their own hands instead of only relying on um, um, outside media. And so the first page of the epic, like what you see before clicking anything, is all student creation, both the images and the words, it's like theirs. <laughs> and, um, and then we had a general editor who proofread the entire work <coughs> afterwards. So, yes. <laughs> so maybe I should show, I can show you some of the links here too, for example, this one. So this is an example of um, the second thing that I asked them to do, which was to go back and find something. Um, anyway, yeah, so they're, they're there. <laughs> and not too many, which I also like. Like, it doesn't need to be, not everything needs to be linked out to everything else. So after the work was done, we actually submitted it to a university-wide competition called Core Scholars. And this is, this is a competition for students who take core classes 
um, and a chance for them to submit creative works that engage uh, with the themes of the course. And submitting to the competition was never our end goal, but I must say that it was a really important impetus or a bonus for the students because from the beginning they felt like what they do is not only meant for my eyes and their own eyes, but it's also for other people to see. And I think um, they had a real sense of audience and that made a big difference. And I think we also made a little precedence with the Columbia Corps um, competition because I think it's traditionally for for uh, single entries, like for solo entries. Mm -hmm. And I went to the core and I said, why not have something that's for bigger groups? Because so much of what we do is so like individual and one person project and why not do something together? So they gave us the freedom to do that. So and that was kind of cool too. In terms of the results, I, I was actually, I felt like the project was a real success and I was quite amazed at the outcome. The actual, when you start reading the poem, it's not really that easy to read, it's quite complex. And um, I was amazed that the students found the tone um, and also it was an exercise in following one another, which is not easy to do, and an exercise in creating something together, which is also not easy to do. Um, and the students themselves, let me go back here, I gathered some um, feedback from the students and it, I got a sense that they said that they really enjoyed the act of creating something together and they engaged with the materials of the course in a different way and thought it was time well spent and were proud of the outcome. And I'll give you also a response of a skeptic. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> that was um, important. Yes, in the spirit of being fearless. Um, and um, as I said, it really was an experiment. Like, I didn't have a specific goal in mind. I was just like, okay, let's see what happens. Uh, let's see how this turns out. Now, now, would I use this exercise again, and what would I do differently? I think I would use the same platform again, but I would find a different, maybe different genre to write in. And uh, I would maybe also put it on the syllabus, so that you just know that it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and um, oh, there's an important a, a point that I would like to emphasize for those of you who are considering using technology in classroom and haven't done it yet, is that it doesn't need to be a big project. Mm -hmm. um, it could be just one activity, one activity that is not very difficult for you as an educator to set up, and an activity that is not really doesn't take that much time from the part of the students to complete. And this one meaningful activity might be just enough. And then one last comment, which is also very important that I want to make, is that, <coughs> so this colla collaborative project was collaborative already from the very start, and, and I learned from it um, how to embrace technology more, but also how to work with somebody together. So I would like to take a moment here and to express my gratitude to Michael Cinema, uh, without whose support, uh, without whose support, knowledge, vision, and continuous positivity, this project <laughs> would never have been born. And so, Michael, I just want to tell you that I consider you one of the great educators of this institution. So, um, my name is Selby. Hi, and I'm Emma. Um, we're both coming from university writing, um, and we started teaching together um, when university writing started creating uh, themed sections. So we both began together um, teaching in what was an entirely new section in um, gender and sexuality under in the core um, in university writing. And um, this year, Emma is co-directing that, and I started co-directing a new theme in human rights. Um, but we continue to work together, um, and. We're going to share with you um, one of our larger projects, which really culminated this semester. But after um, probably a year and a half of slowly being um, drawn into the orbit of, of the uh, CCA and MTL and realizing what was possible. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, don't, th this is a really dynamic um, event that took a lot of planning, so don't try this at home without Adrian. <laughs> so true. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, 
this is a picture of me pointing out that you shouldn't try it at home without <laughs> Richard and Michael. Um, we started. Um, we started very simply. Uh, we were organizing an event um, in university writing uh, which featured um, Rachel Adams from the English department speaking about gender and disability. And we wanted it not to just happen once and be over for the students. We were trying to integrate it into the curriculum so it would be meaningful for them. Um, so uh, I came into the center and um, asked if it was possible for the students in our different sections to write letters to each other. And Michael said yes, and then we had to figure out how to do it, which I think actually involved him putting by hand each of the students' names into this collective wiki. Um, and in the end, students wrote letters to each other about the things that they were learning in um, Rachel Adams' presentation, and they wrote a cross-section, so to people that they didn't know. Um, and once we realized that, uh, that this was possible, we developed much larger um, plans. I'll say one more thing. So this was one of, part of our larger plans, and we began teaching it um, in the fall of last year, I think. Um, and what I mean by we were teaching it is it's a, this is a film called Well Contested Sites, which is a, a movement-based film um, made by a filmmaker, a choreographer, and a group of formerly incarcerated men in San Francisco. Um, and it's shot on Alcatraz, which is a former, the ruins of a former prison. And um, it's a dance film about mm. prison and incarceration. So not maybe something you would think that belonged either in university writing or in the core, but, um, but we were really interested in teaching multimedia for a digital world and teaching um, digital literacy as part of a core. And we wanted our students not only to be able to work with multimedia text, but also to write multimedia essays about the multimedia text they were using. <laughs> Okay, so you can see from this slide, um, you know, the title of their piece, Well Contested Sites, um, for me became a really active phrase in my own classes, uh, where after this whole event took place, we were able to continue talking about cultural sites that are contested. Um, so I want to move to talk about how this integrating not only a digital film, an art film, uh, but also using digital uh, software alongside it to teach it um, actually made, made it uh, really went a long way in terms of establishing a critical vocabulary for a writing class. So uh, one thing that happens when you use media thread um, is, is, is this. <laughs> um, so you upload, you can upload any videos and so students also after this could upload um, videos from YouTube or Vimeo or other sites and they could work through and do close reading and analysis um, and annotation on any of the videos that they wanted to use. So um, this was the video that we used to model how to use this software. And so our section that um, used MediaThread came uh, here in Butler and Adrian ran workshops uh, with our students. So this was not this is work that we actually made space for in our classroom um, to give students a space to learn the technology, right? Because part of the point is um, to teach di digital literacy in the university writing core. And this is brand new, like no one has been doing this in university writing here at Columbia. Um, so there's that space. And so what they're doing here, um, you can see we're, uh, uh, you know, they watched, we watched the film together with Adrian in, in that workshop moment. And then we let students, then Adrian would teach, um, you know, how to use the software. And then students would be able to tag their annotations. Um, so uh, to go back to my point about critical vocabulary, you can see over on the right hand side, these are um, vocabulary keywords that came from the text that we read. Uh, to help us think about the politics of mass incarceration. So you may know Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. Some of us taught that. Some of us taught Angela Davis's work on evolution. Um, so we had, you know, it was up to the instructor to, pick, to, to choose which text they wanted to teach alongside, that we pulled keywords. We asked, you know, why not teach Judith Butler when you're teaching this kind of stuff too? So um, you can see that this is students generating the vocabulary from the readings. Um, we didn't put these keywords in here. So they were able to use this as a place to apply that, vo that vocabulary to um, you know, this 
kind of uh, text and um, then attach their close readings to it. Mm -hmm. So it really dramatizes that process of analysis for them in um, a format that they understand. So I love that. It just it's it's amazing to watch students face when they do this and they're like oh that's what you meant by close reading yeah um, and, and so this yeah, is the, the we were just going to mention if you can see these little colored lines along the bottom that's something that Adrian called for us a heat map and that's where the students close readings are clustering together in the text so they can also see together like where the nodes of their thoughts are coming together why are so many people interested in this one moment in the film are people saying different things about it and you can imagine how that interacts in a sort of matrix with the tags and with the key terms from the text so as Emma was saying we're sort of facilitating and supporting the process of linking intertextual readings together, but they generate the interpretations themselves. Um, and you can see here, I think, one of their close readings, what it looks like when they do an annotation. They make a clip with a time code, um, they pick their own tags, they pick key terms from our set of terms, and they do a tiny close reading that could become a paper. This is another one, um, another one of the close readings. Um, and the, you can see these are just images from the film. So the, the film has to be rich enough, or the visual material you're using has to be rich enough for you um, to feel like your students have room to make their own readings. Um, this was. Um, and then once they learn how to do it, uh, they go on and they do things that you didn't expect. So this is uh, one of my students who learned how to use MediaThread who then went on to write an essay on a text that I wasn't teaching um, for her research project, which was about um, the use of oral history um, in a human rights context in post-Katrina New Orleans, and it was about historiography and the right to, to one's own narrative. And she picked the clips and found the films, and you can see those clips are integrated into the writing of the essay. Um, so this is just shots from, from her um, piece. <coughs> Okay, so um, uh, I should say maybe that Dr. Schwartz is a dance scholar, so that's um, in part how um, it came to be this film that was chosen. And so she actually kind of piloted this within UW um, in the spring last year mm -hmm. and taught it and, and learned media thread. And um, meanwhile, in the background, we were appealing to various uh, uh, funding sources at Columbia hoping to bring those artists to campus um, for a, an event for UW. So this is what happened. We finally succeeded. Um, so there was a, a two-day symposium here at Columbia on art and the politics of um, incarceration. And you know, this I think we would just like to testify to um, how the use of new media, um, you know, and and through your help, Michael and Adrian, um, we were able to do so much outreach. So it wasn't just university. Um, there was one, it was a two-day symposium, so there was one event just um, for UW section, so we were able to bridge the gap between the, the pilot sections in human rights and gender studies, but also there's a section in American studies, so that was really useful to them. Um, yeah. And then the public event, we uh, you know, really were able to involve the community as well. And what you're looking at here is one face of something that we did, which this is a research blog um, that the people in Cedars um, helped me to build. And it's connected to all of these other things that the people in CC and MTL helped us to build. Um, so once we had funding from the Justice Initiative, which um, sponsored this project, and then Barnard Dance also co-sponsored it, and CC and MTL. Um, and so with all of the joint support, we were able to do things like create this research blog um, and, a lot of, and use a lot of well, for us, pilot a lot of new technology live as um, the events were happening. So in the university writing event, we had 11 sections of university writing and some librarians and some people from CC and MTL. The directors of university writing came. I think it was a very interesting exper experiment for all of us. Um, and uh, Adrian was particularly enthusiastic in supporting us as we tried to pilot all kinds of new things at once um, together. So yeah. Right, so uh, Adrian came to a meeting that we had in UW with um, instructors who wanted to use well-contested site in their curriculum. Um, and while we were there, um, I believe Adrian had the idea. I think we're it was you. Sure. <laughs> we're not sure. We're sure. brainstorming session. Uh, but we decided we wanted to use Twitter um, at the event to allow for a space for students to respond live um, to the event as it was unfolding. Um, 
so I think, you know, on the one hand, you'll see in the next slide, I think, um, students began the conversation first on Friday when we had the UW event. Um, but then when the event, the second event on Saturday, um, was open to the public and featured a panel um, of Columbia scholars from across discipline. Um, you know, once, once people joined in the conversation, it was cool to see that the students had st already started this conversation and that it had been gone on, ongoing. Um, I think that, you know, it was important, it made sense to me to use Twitter because uh, one of the things we teach in UW, we're always talking about public discourse. Um, and what it means to be ethical communicators and, and um, sort of, you know, have, have a, a sense of ethics around that. So this actually um, was something that enacted that for our students. Um, so we were able to have great conversations in the classroom about what it means to take part in, the, in public discourse. Um, but it also added this digital layer to the event itself, which I think another person's presentation, right, this can be really great for introver introverted students, but it really invited the maximum number of voices to kind of um, respond to this event. We're always talking about response and critical response. Um, you know, it's pretty massive, but here um, people were able to kind of gain confidence in terms of responding in that way. Um, so it went over quite well. <coughs> Yeah, and I have to say, actually, this was Emma's idea, and I was a skeptic because I tried to get my students not to have their iPhones out during class, and I imagine them all having them out during the conference, and I was won over because I was seeing, instead of like the three students who always have their hands up asking the questions, everybody live tweeting at the conference, and people who didn't have Twitter accounts. Um, this is Tagboard, which um, Adrian made up for us so that we could display all the tweets in this nice um, interactive format. Um, those who didn't have Twitter accounts were able to post their questions live to this ed blog that she made, so there were options. And we did allow students to write, just non-technological students, to write on um, index cards, and we got five index cards out of the whole audience <laughs> of, of 11 sections of university writing. Um, so uh, yeah, so these are some of the And I also questions. want to say, like, this part of why we like to do these events with our UW students is many of, you know, as freshmen, this is often their very first um, event that they attend on campus. So they don't know what to expect. They don't know what a Q&A is. Um, so it's been really nice to give them the, this space and these events to do that. So the tech, this element of technology that we added to this event this time, um, I also was you know, behind it because I know that Twitter you know, is increasingly used at conferences you know, as a way to archive and have discussions that are going on you know, at the same time as a panel is unfolding or something. Um, yeah, so you can see some of the questions in the, this is the ed blog. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the last um, slide. <laughs> so the only thing I wanted to say is there's a slide that's not up here, which is because I'm in the process of working on it, which is where all of this is being archived. And again, Adrian and Michael have been so helpful in this. So in the research blog now, we've been able to film both events embed the films in the Columbia YouTube channel, re-embed the films in, in resources for um, future UW sections, people who are interested in mass incarceration. Um, the Justice Initiative is using it. The Twitter thing is still live, and every once in a while, I'm not a great Twitter user, every once in a while, like, I see my words or things I've retweeted go around the world, and I'm getting used to that. Um, so I feel like, um, I mean, one of the things that I, that, that I think we both learned from it were was the possibility of um, engaging the students ethically and intellectually at the same time mm -hmm. through new media. Mm -hmm. so, and so they were pro being professionalized in a way, but in a way that instead of, of um, shutting down the part of them that always wants to look at their iPhones, mm -hmm. engaged that part and brought it into the classroom and then brought the classroom into the world. So they really felt like they were in dialogue with people who are talking about something that's you know, possibly, as Michelle Alexander says, the civil rights issue of our times. Thanks. So please pick up your certificate. Let's move over to the other room. We could talk. There's food and coffee. Um, and we could continue the conversation. We'll Thank be you. back in yes. the fall. We'll be back fall in the fall with new talks. And uh, I hope we grow even bigger. Thank you very Thank much. You.